Welcome back to Landmarks Discovered. In this episode, we'll visit Palm Beach's only private island, Tarpon Island. When we think about the history of Palm Beach, we can really see that they were moving a lot of land around. We can see in the north end that they filled in lakes to create land. They filled in a bog near the sea streets to create land. And they really dredged up the intercoastal area to create Everglades Island and Tarpon Island. And similarly, the Everglades Club also has quite a bit of fill on which it was built. In modern times, this creates an interesting challenge with sea level rise. These are areas that are man-made and they are particularly low-lying and susceptible to flooding. And that brings us to what this house represents to us today. I mean, it's been listed as a historically significant building, so it's one of the first structures we're featuring that is not a landmark. The town of Palm Beach recently updated their historic site survey, and they found that roughly a thousand buildings are eligible for either landmarking or historically significant buildings. And what this means is the building is at least 50 years or older. And many of those buildings that are 50 years or older do not meet current FEMA requirements. These buildings were built at a much lower elevation than is currently required for new construction. And I have to admit, I definitely had reservations about the Historically Significant Building Program because essentially it was extending one of the benefits that are afforded to landmark buildings, which is a variance from FEMA requirements, without protecting them from demolition. However, in looking at the impact of the program in its totality, it in reality is really preserving a lot of the historic character of the town by preserving the original fabric. And really this program allows the owners to kind of take the time and make the decision at what is best for them when it comes to flood preparation. So it really staves off the demolition of a house that might have been demolished because of these FEMA rules, and it allows them to be exempt from that. I think it's a great case study on modern preservation and how we have to kind of transform our traditional ideas to really fit the future. As traditional preservationists, this program is really a completely new concept. It really challenges the ideas of what preservation is and how we can interpret it to the public. Tarpon Island is not only interesting in that it's taking advantage of the historically significant building program, which is a relatively new concept or interpretation of preservation. It also is a great example of how we also have to adapt our ideas of what to preserve in terms of the natural environment. Historically, Tarpon Island has been surrounded by Australian pines, which are so intertwined with the history of the island because so many of the grand estates have historically had them as part of the property. However, today we know that Australian pines are now a category one invasive species, which means due to their inherent nature, they prevent native plants from flourishing, which are needed to sustain healthy wildlife populations. And this really speaks to the idea that, you know, preservation isn't just about buildings. It's really about protecting our whole cultural landscape the native environment that we live in, along with the buildings, so they work together to create the historic character that we all love. 
So the first owner of Tarpon Island was Stuart Davis, and he commissioned Howard Major in 1939 to build the building that's currently there. He received his wealth from his father, who was an inventor, and he invented Perry Davis's vegetable painkiller. Which interestingly could be both ingested and topically applied, which makes one wonder what exactly was in it. It also makes me think about the snake oil salesman that we associate with that period of time before we had many of the over-the-counter brands that we know today. Well, not a snake oil salesman. The next owner of Tarpon Island was Wiley Reynolds Jr., who was the president of First National Bank. And an interesting connection between the bank and the property on Tarpon Island is that John Volk designed the First National Bank in 1937, and Reynolds hired him to do later additions on the major design property. And in our archives, you can see the different designs that John Volk did for the pool pavilion. So one of his designs was really mid-century in design and kind of different from the original structure of Howard Major. But the one they ended up going with really fits in with Howard Major's Bermuda-style house. And when you see the pool pavilion, it's remarkable its proximity to the water. Today, modern building and zoning codes would never allow something like this to be constructed. However, the Landmarks Program and now the Historically Significant Building Program allow features like this to be preserved and continue in their original design intent rather than having to be brought up to code. And this episode provides a great opportunity to introduce everyone to our Director of Education, Amy Sunny. Amy has recently taken on a greater advocacy role at the Landmarks Preservation Commission meetings. In addition to working with the town's preservation consultants and staff, she works with stakeholders in the community to ensure the best possible preservation outcomes for projects coming before the Landmarks Commission. Tarpon Island is the first property that we're featuring on Landmarks Discovered that is a historically significant building rather than a landmark. The Historically Significant Building Program was created last year in order to help save more of the older building stock in the town of Palm Beach. So in order to qualify for the Historically Significant Building Program, a structure has to be over 50 years old, and it also has to meet one of four criteria that were laid out in the ordinance that was adopted last year. Additionally, it has to be located in a conservation district, and the Town Council has already taken a really bold initiative to approve conservation districts that cover almost 99 percent of the island, making almost all of the structures that are 50 years or older potentially eligible for this um, historically significant building program. The program came out of the conundrum in the town that much of the town's aging building stock, the, those buildings 50 years or older, were starting to be torn down because of the substantial improvement rule. So according to FEMA regulations, if you're going to renovate a structure and you go beyond 50% of the assessed value of the structure, you have to raise the entire building to meet the minimum FEMA required flood elevation. This house recently sold for $85 million, but according to the property appraiser, the structure is only valued at a little under $2 million. And so when it comes to keeping in mind the substantial improvement rule, if the new owners of the structure want to do renovations that exceed a million dollars, they could potentially trigger the substantial improvement rule, which would mean that they would need to elevate any portions of the house that don't meet the current minimum flood elevation requirements based on the FEMA regulations. So this new program, the Historically Significant Building Program, allows the owner to apply for an exemption to the requirement to elevate the structure and therefore allows additional segments of the house to be preserved in their current location and in their current setting. The original portion of the house was designed in 1939 by Howard Major and John Bolt came in from 1949 to 1963 with a series of additions. Howard Major felt that Mediterranean Revival architecture was not well suited to the climate and it actually described many of the structures as cellars, perhaps referring to the fact that Mediterranean Revival structures often had smaller and fewer windows, whereas the British West Indies style that he was a proponent for has larger windows that would take advantage of the prevailing breezes. He also wrote that he really liked to use jalousies or louvered shutters to help create additional airflow into his structures. Some of the important character defining features of the structure include the flat white tile roof, the shaped parapets, the wood windows and doors, and specifically sash windows as opposed to casement windows that you might find in a Mediterranean revival structure, 
There are wide overhanging balconies and porches, and you can see here the lovely Chippendale railings. One unique feature about this house is the window behind me, which was used on the southern facade to help create balance. In addition to this being the first time that we're featuring a historically significant building, it's also the first time that we're featuring a building prior to its renovation. The initial rehabilitation proposal for this project showed a substantial amount of demolition on the western side of the building. The architect for this project, Roger Jansen, was very receptive to addressing our concerns regarding the level of demolition proposed for this structure. By working together, we were able to identify a way to preserve more of the original structure. The day before the Landmarks meeting, Roger produced a sketch that showed preserving more of the original portion of the structure. It was approved by the property owner and presented at the Landmarks Commission, where it was enthusiastically received. Like many of our past episodes, this episode of Landmarks Discovered provides a vehicle to explore the modern day preservation challenges and tools available to preserve the historic character of the town. The Historically Significant Building Program is innovative in that it provides an alternative to demolition, and we can see how it's specifically applied in this episode to Tarpon Island. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Landmarks Discovered.